Okay, so this is lecture number one, introduction, a recorded course for the International School of Systemology. These course lectures are going to be recorded and transcribed for the Systemology Air Command, and they can be used pretty much by anyone. I can see you, uh, you all got your course textbooks, uh, Tablets of Destiny, Crystal Clear and whatnot there. Well, uh, you won't actually need those today, so if you want to actually put those up, your chairs or whatnot, it won't be necessary. This is uh, a Mardukite Systemology Introduction course. It's, uh, lecture series called The Power of Zoo. And you don't really need to know anything about the Mardukites or systemology to get some benefit from this course. Um, it's going to be recorded and distributed uh, for the School of Systemology and a transcription will be available, so you won't need to take a lot of notes. Uh, so what I've been asked to do, we've been released now Tablets of Destiny, Crystal Clear, and unleash this new thing onto the world called Mardukite Systemology. And in doing so, we have actually called into awareness this thing called awareness and in doing so we're going back to what is called zoo in ancient Sumerian cuneiform. If you don't really need to know anything about the ancient Sumerians to understand what I'm about to explain. So as an introduction, as uh, some background, give you a bit of a summary of this. Uh, the power of zoo, we're dealing with the vital force of existence. And so my notes here that I have, well, what I'm going to do is answer some questions without making it seem like I'm answering some questions and try to provide a little bit of background before we really get into this thing. So the premise behind this is the pursuit of a vital force behind all of life, the universe, and everything. This is what's fueled my own efforts toward uh, a unique futuristic next-gen systemology uh, since the days of my youth least since the late 1990s, but in spite of any other interests that I've applied to this quest along the way, ranging from esoteric occult mysticism to quantum physics, metapsychology, my personal aim has remained to codify the underlying systemology of existence. And this for me represents a holistic and unified understanding of the universe, of apparent reality as experienced from the human condition and, and those using the human condition to experience a reality in this physical universe. So that's what we're dealing with now. Um, come a long way from from the start of uh, mysticism and, and metaphysics. Some people are familiar with some of my more publicly known works, but really this, is, uh, this has been a long time in development. Um, now my interest to develop an improved systemology for the human condition really began during my teen years, during the 1990s and it would take at least another decade to officially codify anything of this direction directly.
but the underlying premise remained unchanged. It remains so to this day. Uh, even after all of these later developments have ensued. So, it is a fact that at the original inception of my research, I maintained my own personal purposes and reasons for uncovering and developing a Mardukite paradigm and an applied systemology specifically for myself, for my own personal reasons. And uh, the sheer fact that the abundance of my underground work, even from its earliest years and versions, proved exceptionally useful and effective for others. Uh, this is not hindered by the first fact that this solely became uh, a result of my own personal my own personal quest, my own personal journey, and the fact that others would find some benefit and use of this uh, kept me working to present the material that I had uncovered and refined publicly. But in the mid-1990s, uh, the apex of a new age pop culture surge was taking place, leading the way for me to assume a position early on in the underground scene as Marlon Stone. But my, my personal interest did not solely occupy one track of validating mysticism or avenues of magic, which I saw merely as one of many paradigms seeking to approach uh, higher understanding of life and uh, our experience of the physical universe. But it was unique on one point. This magic, it qualified the existence of something more, or beyond, or higher than, what was readily available in what we call beta experience. And uh, the observable objective phenomenon that's restricted to matter in the physical universe. So what lies in the sensory range of the human condition, what uh, we refer to as the energy and matter of the physical universe, this is, this is what beta experience is uh, wired to receive. We call this beta as opposed to an alpha, as opposed to a first form. But uh, as a teenager in the, in the 90s, the public school system definitely attempted to indoctrinate me deeper towards some specific academic goal, whatever that might have been. It became abundantly clear that a selection of any one of these available paradigms would force me further into an exclusionary viewpoint of observing life and the universe as one or another effect, never getting closer to a cause. So I was after a cause. Now, although physics, quantum physics, higher spiritual applications, string theory, now these were growing intellectual hobbies of mine, uh, but I found myself unable to get beyond my own disinterest in the intensive mathematics required to treat these subjects at an academic level. In fact, uh, I found this to be the case for myself with most of the physical sciences, because in my own mind, I did not believe that my own path and the abilities it could unfold should require such an intensive pursuit of chemical calculus or complex equations for unrealistic laboratory experiments uh, in order to be effective. My understanding, as I discovered it, is that the ancient mystery school operated on principles or postulates, which were only later qualified with Babylonian and Egyptian Greek, so forth, the uh, schools of mathematical philosophies that came later. But these fundamentals of existence, the original knowledge 
existence were not born from these equations. They were only validated by them much later by philosophers. I concluded that any important theorems or a priori axioms should stand as themselves if they were true. And any supplemental demonstrations or equation proofs would only be necessary for certain communications of application, instruction, in particular fields or paradigms. But even without these to support objectively, facts behind them should remain facts if they were indeed facts. So I concluded that a conceptual understanding at best, at least for my own purposes, was all that would be necessary regarding each of these fields. And while over the course of time I would perhaps be called forth as no greater expert in any one of these fields than the next guy, I've, uh, I've usually been able to apply this wide-angle view of understanding directly to my holistic work and have found that it is, more often than not, recognized by readers that are more likely to receive this information in terms of uh, such general lines of communication that they're more familiar with. My strongest academic interests fell in the domain of what they considered social sciences, but naturally, I was interested in collecting all of the information I could about the systems. Uh, I started earning college credit for attending courses at a nearby campus while I was still in high school, and the only sure fit I could find at the beginning of this to satisfy the requirements was a major in psychology with a minor in philosophy. I also took all the anthropology courses I could, figuring, well, that the study of primitive man should yield something of value to me. But aside from a potential career in forensics, uh, which uh, I would have had to better apply myself to memorizing all of the uh, human bones and such, I, uh, I did not find any of my answers there. So after high school and uh, some of this college, I also had some run-ins and mentorships with um, most of the mystical, magical organizations in operation. Uh, most of the ones that you've heard of, uh, read about, probably own books from. Um, it's not really too important when we get into these things. I've, I've covered a lot of this in earlier uh, installments, um, not necessarily lectures, but earlier books and so forth, uh, referred to as grade one, grade two. So, um, I spent the first few years of the new millennium immersed in traditional academics, um, actually, in college, all the while really seeking the specific facets that I would require to compile my own work, my own working universal philosophy, which would hopefully result in an effective uh, dispersal of uh, a new thought, a new thought paradigm that could be applied by anyone um, and would advance, advance what we consider the human species into a, a new vista, new possibilities. Um, really, my, my inspiration I uh, was uh, driven by the idea of shaping the, the future of what was called uh, creative psychology, what they called it. I'm not even sure after this 20 years later creative psychology still exists. Uh, I started calling it meta-psychology. And uh, it was really at the time strongly based on my researches into uh, Carl Jung and uh, Timothy Leary, uh, to name a few. Um, those that seem to perhaps have gleaned something true about this thing called consciousness, the mind. Uh, it seemed that an intellectual pursuit into the mind would necessarily resolve 
what I needed to uncover about the human condition, and hopefully, too, information that might unfold the potentials of the spirit. So I was also reminded by several of those in my vicinity that if I did not require, if I did not acquire the credentials, the academic credentials by the superiors of our society, that I would be unable to make my desired contributions or receive any financial contributions from others toward the development of this work. So I cautiously agreed. And when I got to college and embarked on this mission to earn an academic degree, I was disappointed. No, that's not completely disillusioned regarding everything I thought I would be permitted to learn or encouraged to do. So after a few years of being taught by behaviorist professors and seeing all around me the evidence that any academic pursuits toward the mind had been replaced solely by the brain, I dropped the field altogether to complete a degree in a more mechanical education that might pay a few bills while I pursued the research independently and in secret for many years, even before emerging on the public scene with the Mardukite movement in 2008. There's actually many gaps in my work before and after this pivotal inception of the Mardukite paragram. And to this, uh, my own answer is that attention has been consistently been put into the development of a true and faithful and complete and effective, relevant and futurist applied spiritual technology behind Mardukite Zooism called systemology or else Mardukite systemology. So I then set out to develop my own systemology, except it was not my own, it was the universe. But my academic background did not catch up with the spiritual or metaphysical truth that I knew something of from direct experience, and yet I was at a great loss for finding the right words and semantics to communicate anything of it directly. So whenever I turned toward established sciences and philosophies and pre-existing isms, I would reach a barrier. Each set of semantics belonged to one or another paradigm. Each operated in an exclusion to all others. And although there were certain concepts and principles and axioms that I might cherry pick along the journey, or certain facets that I might find a use for within my own developments, there was really no way of accomplishing what I set out to do by fixing or extending some pre-existing semantic paradigm, philosophy, or science. Trying to attempt to repair any of these paradigms from within any of these paradigms was most certainly folly. And I had already read the works and observed efforts of many others who had already gone forth on that same premise in whatever specific avenue they pursued. None were directly successful in doing anything other than extending or advancing one particular paradigm or another only effective in furthering the fragmentation and applying deeper intellectual exclusions to knowledge. And any of this would be entirely counterproductive to my own intentions. That much was obvious. <laughs> so, there were too many flaws with the conventional methodology, the systems inherent in conventional education, and it became clear that there was no room for any innovation 
progression or advancement within the institutions that instructed in this patterned copy and paste from previous generations, the, the same previous generations that sent us speeding down the plummet into a pool of unnecessary suffering, destruction, and devastation as we are seeing it today. I wasn't interested in being like Freud. I didn't want to starve dogs into drooling to the sound of bells. I found no logic in torturing the animal kingdom as a means to any worthwhile realizations for the human psyche. Psyche. That's, it's a word that was originally attached to the soul, or the spirit, or at the very least the mind the human condition, uh, but it could not be found in any of the accepted academic sciences or applied philosophies, including psychology, which was named directly for that word, psyche. I mean, these were the type of people that spent millions of dollars to prove that hungry rats will chase through mazes to find cheese. In every attempt to demonstrate something of value with human subjects, such as the guards versus prisoner experiment, yeah, proved to be a disaster. Certainly, this allegedly higher education could offer no actual avenues out of this program state of low awareness that humanity had succumbed to. Now, had I thought switching my major and minor would have been an improvement, I, I probably would have. But ceaseless conjecture of existing classical philosophy was only of small benefit directly. And of these, the one that stood apart was logic. And perhaps the premise behind the schools of epistemology. They did not exclusively provide answers. Methods of which answers might be better evaluated objectively, perhaps, but no answers. Most of the other relevant schools of philosophy remained in the domain of philosophy and not science, simply because they remained outside the realm of empirical or external observation. As a result, the schools or paradigms were far-reaching in their own directions and uh, only furthered an idea of a perpetual maybe by existing on opposing ends of some dualistic polar dichotomy. Now, this, this idea of dualism is, uh, is rampant in every field. You know, each piece of data treated in exclusion to another, within a parameter or fixed range along some line, usually between perceived extremes. They don't they don't provide us with answers such as yes or no. That's that's that keeps uh you know that that's what keeps our human understanding and its state of actualized awareness suspended in a state of maybe in perpetuity. So I was after something else. And uh, something which I did not even discover a word for until after I left the realm of academia. And I was after a knowledge of everything as I could be plotted on a, a monistic continuum of a singular unified force. Apparently this was the goal. And results of this pursuit... Uh, they really, uh, they really only uh, started when we made a, a milestone breakthrough, uh, as now called the uh, standard model for systemology.
you know, early versions of this knowledge. Uh, so it was originally presented the, such that emphasis um, back when we were doing the Mardukite grade two phase in 2009 and the reality engineering series of lectures. Um, but uh, this, uh, those same series of lectures actually uh, appeared in portions of uh, the introductory section of our uh, complete Anunnaki Bible. And uh, other portions uh, contributed basically the materials for our systemology of the original thesis and uh, basically supports a companion textbook of that name. So we're using this to prompt uh, a new thought division of the Mardukite Chamberlains. Um, the Mardukite Research Organization as governed by Mardukite Ministries. And this is how we developed the Next Gen Systemology Society. Um, when we compare the slow but exponential developmental timeline marking the improved codification of Next Gen Systemology since my original conception of the idea, uh, what has really changed between then and now, uh, between the older materials, uh, systemology, the original thesis, uh, even Lieber R, versus the newer progressive innovations like Tablets of Destiny and Crystal Clear, is essentially a unification of all that we know and could possibly know using the standard model. And this was actually made effective and applicable now for us today with the discovery of something previously overlooked. And yet it was buried directly within the divine wisdom alluded to in our ancient Mesopotamian grade two work, it's called Zu. Zu. <laughs> when uh, when this information could be coherently presented as a foundation for grade three Mardukite systemology then a relay of these discoveries was immediately released as Tablets of Destiny and its companion course textbook, Crystal Clear. But it should be understood, it took many years of quiet, covert, behind the scenes, refinement, to actually reach these newer developments. And so that brings us up pretty much today, brings us up to present time. So with this, uh, this brief series of lectures, I've been asked to prepare in the intention that they will form something of an introduction course uh, that will provide some of the untold background and additional applications of the research that uh, is present in our work and that we were using for rudimentary experiments, Mardukite systemology, uh, long before our more recent and continuing developments in systemology processing. Uh, in the past, we've been unable to successfully unite a standard model with a singularity because the research methods kept us away from anything that might denote polarity. But this has since been rectified um, by our understanding of activity present in the physical universe in connection to, well, really one specific aspect is the interconnectivity 
that there is something, somehow, extended from a spiritual universe. And we recognize that the polarity for the model is necessary for apparent action. It's not the same as fragmentation in knowledge and understanding. That's, that's a different kind of dichotomy, a different kind of polarity. So that we can now, in grade three, demonstrate what we call the zoo line across a standard model of existences is a significance that just cannot be cannot be understated at this point. This is this is what is allowing for all progressive future development of this philosophy as an applied spiritual technology. And it is essentially the only next giant paradigm that is not only taking into account all that has already been considered and everything that I've already explained about its development here, but also the future fate of the human condition in arriving at its destination at a higher state of awareness and ultimately a spiritual evolution. Now there are so many paramount matters affecting humanity today and uh, you know I, I could certainly sit and create an entire course that would regard little else but the truth is that we can look at this holistically and these problems inherent in the human condition directly regarding its physical environment on planet earth presumably throughout the cosmos and beyond these all regardless of their nature can actually be resolved if we take the steps toward an elevation in our capacity for actualized awareness So, assuming this cannot be expeditiously conducted on each of the billions of individuals sharing an experience of the human condition around the planet, uh, there are some steps that must be taken by those hearing the call and willing to assume the responsibility toward co-creating the future course of our existence. Now, all of this is a group effort. It's based on the singular intentions of its members united together. And uh, this requires true communication of ideas, energy, power, across a worldwide network to be effective. But it very clearly and most certainly begins with a strong and healthy individual, which is also something that uh, we will be emphasizing in this current lecture series. The strength and continuation of the human the hybrid human species, the strength of the society, the strength of community it occupies, the strength of our organizations representing and carrying Mardukite Zooism and Mardukite systemology into the future. All of these are dependent on the strength and integrity of the individuals. And as always, it begins and ends with self. The ancients instructed to know thyself and through self know all. And I 
can think of no greater, loftier, more applicable ideal to achieve these ends than this journey we are on now. The pathway to self-honesty and beyond. And how we get there, we will take that up in our next lecture. Thank you.